Hey everybody, Mark Ahrensberg here with The Pure Now Show. This is episode number 34. My guest today is Hui Nguyen. Hui is the group CEO at Pencil Group, the founder and managing director of DigiPencil, managing partner at Pencil Ventures, and a book author amongst everything else that he does. He loves putting people together and making things happen. Here we go. Hello, Hui. Hello. How are you, man? I'm very well. Excellent. How are you doing there? I'm doing great. Thank you. Appreciate it. Uh, we're really excited to have you on the Pure Now show. Thank you so much for making some time to come uh, on and chat with us about your career and all the things that are happening with you. And you seem like a super busy guy. Is that true? No, I uh, always tell people that I'm not busy at all. I always make time for important things. Okay. Uh, I still have time to uh, enjoy a coffee in the morning, going early and talk to my little girls at home. So awesome. Okay. Obviously, well, I'm not, not busy. <laughs> well, uh, it sounds like you have some good balance in your life, which is something that we'll touch on and, and talk about a bit. But... Uh, you're located in Saigon? Yes. So we have our main office is here. We just recently opened an office in Dalat, in oh. the Highland. That's where the weather is the best. You, you don't have to tell me. It's the only time in over two years that I've been cold in Vietnam. I actually love it there. So it there. Yeah, it reminds me a lot of the Bay Area of San Francisco a little bit. It's very green with, with the big trees and that beautiful lake in the center. No, I think I could easily live there. I mean, I love Saigon. Don't get me wrong. But Dalat is more in line with my preferred climate, which is on the cooler side. It's like 70, 75 degrees right now, which is literally perfect weather. Yeah, so we opened a pencil creative hub there. A small office with, uh, with a garden uh, where people can work in the best weather, the best climate. It sounds fantastic. Well, let's talk a little bit about uh, pencil here. It's been, uh, it's gone through some different iterations uh, as a company. You've kind of built this empire, if you will. Um, I, I know that you're you're an investor. You're you're into a lot of. Uh, I know you're heavily in the creative, but you're also a lot in development and supporting financially supporting ventures. You're also an author. Uh, you've got a lot of things going on. Uh, what's key for you right now? What are you working on right now? Well, I'm still a creative. Um, that's a different way. So I started as a designer since uh, 2003. Uh, started the Gucci Creative since 2005 and then closed it after one year, which was the, uh, the foundation for Pencil Group right now. We basically like a, a creative network. So we, we have creative agency, we have digital agency, and we also love to invest into other creative businesses like uh, films, fashion, music, technology as well. So we, we can combine the power of creativity and technology to serve our clients better. So it sounds like a lot, but it's actually a close ecosystem where people can work together to deliver better ideas for companies. So it sounds like you're, you're kind of taking ownership of all the capabilities so you can offer a much broader scope of solutions to your clients that you sort of own. I mean, instead of having to reach out a lot, it sounds like you're just building this company that has all the capabilities as a one-stop shop. Exactly. So we don't have the capability to do everything on our own. So the best way I see is to invest financially and uh, putting our expertise into helping other people to build their companies. That somehow they can associate with our services to serve the clients. And that has been working very well. Well, let's talk about your beginnings. I want to know how this all started. You're a young boy living in Vietnam. Are you raised by uh, a traditional Vietnamese family? 
Yes, I was born and raised in Vietnam. Uh, my parents actually sometimes working in Europe, but I haven't been able to visit Europe. I self touched myself designing things by Photoshop back when I was at uh, high school. So since then, I've been a designer. Uh, I started uh, my own team in 2005 and then to close it down. So that was when I was 20. I was too young to manage anything my own. So then I joined other agency to learn. The two bosses that I learned much from is the founder of Who Digital, which was a pioneering digital agency in Vietnam. So I worked with them since 2006. In 2011, uh, the company was acquired by Ogilvy Worldwide Vietnam, so we become part of Ogilvy. So my last position at Ogilvy was Chief Digital Officer. In 2014, I started uh, Dizzy Pencil, the digital agency, the first member of Pencil Group, like it is right now. In uh, 2019, we opened the creative agency. Uh, we started to work with uh, big clients here. We was very lucky. Everything picked up from 2019. My pencil venture, the venture that we uh, we invested into other creative and tech companies, actually started from 2014, right when I left Ogilvy. There was some uh, good investment, some bad investment until 2019. We really understand our strategy and we will be able to put in every investment and every internal resources, every service we have to one big vision. And uh, since then, things uh, are working quite well. Uh, we hope we can expand that, compete with uh, the biggest agency here. Well, I want to talk about more about you being a boy growing up. What inspired you? I mean, obviously, you made a conscious decision to go down this creative path. Before you knew of Photoshop, maybe you were uh, an illustrator, maybe you were drawing, maybe you were excited about something. What was maybe one of those events in your life as a boy, as a young boy, that started to inform you that this was the professional path that you were going to go down? I don't know if it's interesting because I started learning Photoshop just because it is cool to be able to design some graphic avatar for our high school's forum. So back then, when we opened our public online forum for our high school, everyone wants a, a beautiful avatar. So the guys who can design that seems like a cool guy in the school. So I started learning just because of that. I didn't know that it could become a career, honestly. I, I studied I spe study specialized in math. Um, so I, I was thinking that maybe I'll become a developer. Uh, a, a, a programmer, so uh, it should be a technology career. Uh, but that is when I uh, arrived to Saigon. When I started my university career, uh, I needed a part-time job, and luckily, that skill set that I learned from high school becomes something valuable. I can make money during the time I was at university. And uh, I dropped out of university. I dropped out of university when the career as a creative picked up. And I actually can make money from that and the work is fun. So in the third year of the university, I decided I should persuade uh, this career path instead of being a tech guy. But you're kind of a hybrid because you leveraged your math and you leveraged that left brain, right brain. You've kind of put them together now. I mean, you look like a very young guy, but you clearly have taken both hemispheres of your brain and leveraged them to create this much bigger company where you've required this different kind of thinking over here and this different kind of thinking over there and amassed what you have now through leveraging uh Again, both sides of your brain. A not a lot of people can do that. I find that very rare where you find somebody who's intensely creative 
but can also master the business side because they seem so uh, polar opposite. But there are very few, which is why you're having this success, who have managed to merge this into one, you know, high level thinking brain. Was there any specific things that you had to go through earlier in your professional career to decide that you could handle all this? Because, you know, there's creative management with with uh, pipelines and timelines and and the work itself and, and managing clients. And there's the business side with finances and budgets and all these other things. What told you that you could do it all? I think I was lucky. Back when the time when I started my career as a creative, there was a flash action script. It's a technology combined creativity and technology. I can design and, and code games, web, interactive websites, galleries, um, virtual space where people can connect with each other. And I met a, a boss, his name was Alfie. So Alfie taught me how to combine creativity and technology to develop interactive applications. Um, he also had that left brain, right brain combination. So I watched how he worked. I watched how he bring logical thinking into creative design, into user experience design. You know, from then, um, I, I, I don't think that there is a really big gap between the left brain and the right brain anymore. Everything I do in terms of designs or ideation, it, it starts with a logical thinking, it starts with a strategic thought and vice versa. So I'm not like a, a, a creative who was, uh, who was graduated from a creative school, from a design school, and I haven't finished my technology bachelor degree. So that's why I think my, I was lucky because my mindset was very open and I met a, a mentor who actually took me from the same, his same journey, inspiring me on creating experience like design experience and coding experience that could combine those two. Maybe the young guys that now they don't know what flash accent script is. Maybe now it's HTML5, now it's uh, other technology. Uh, but it's the same principle where you can create experience. It's also beautiful, but it's also useful as well. And you need to use logical thinking to develop the experience. You also use your creativity to feel the colors, to feel the, the, the typography. So all of that combined. I think a lot of people like me, yeah. Currently, in, 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 currently in, in this um, new world where it's, everything is digital, so what you design is what you create is not a key visual, it's not a TVC, it's not only that, but it's own experience, and experience requires both left, left side brand and right side brand. You're listening to The Pure Now Show, a creative podcast for creatives presented by Balance. So it's essentially design now needs to have function, not just visual representation. Things are moving, things are being used in a variety of platforms to express the brand messages and uh, reach customers in a certain way. So what you have done is you've encapsulated everything into sort of a singular solution through the pencil group and this is something that's unusual for Vietnam because I don't think there's a lot of uh, companies doing things exactly like you're doing them. You're kind of pioneering things in Vietnam, uh, uh, taking Vietnam into maybe the next century of uh, design and innovation with te technology that was not existing before. How do you feel about being kind of a pioneer in Southeast Asia, in Vietnam, uh, raising the bar, as it were, to get other companies to start, you know, stepping up to the plate and and meeting the future right now. We're very proud. So we we are curious people. That's why we explore things differently. Because of that, we we always be proud that we may not be the biggest 
company in this creative industry in Vietnam that we want to be the coolest, we want to be the pioneer wing agency. And we have done that. So we explore uh, augmented reality, virtual reality, uh, 360 videos, uh, other technology and experience very early. Uh, even when our clients have no budget for it, we already work with them, trying to propose it to them, trying to get some innovation budget from them to experiment. And that results um, some projects that was very cool and people know us about that. In this market, it started to be very mature, where you always have to find new things to impress consumers. And I find more and more brands in Vietnam, both uh, from the multinational uh, company size and you know, the local enterprise size, they are much more open to new ways of doing uh, communication. So we're very proud of that. We hope that we can inspire a new generation of creatives to think the same. So it would be great if they can think further than a key visual, further than a storyboard, and think like more experience. Do you think maybe too, because of COVID and the way things have changed, that maybe companies in Vietnam are more accessible, they're more open to the potential of taking some creative risks that they didn't take before? Uh, because this has been kind of a conservative market for the most part. But uh, are you seeing now that there is more risk taking, that people are willing to stretch beyond just their logo and the basic TVC and social media that they're willing to expand on how they present uh, to their audience? Absolutely, that uh, they, they are open more to risk. And this is not because they wanted to, it's because of the consumer pushed them to. So the competition is so, so hard, so it's very crowded in the market um, and consumer, especially the younger consumer like, uh, like, like Gen Z's, they, they, they really have a short attention span. So everything brand do, everything brand used to do, everything they did probably still work in a way, but it's not as good as it was before and the pressure on results is much higher, especially during COVID, because the business, the business results are challenged. Um, so the more and more uh, pressure from consumer, from the market, from competition, from COVID situation, results a new generation of decision maker who can open, who can be open more for innovative things. I'm glad that, that uh, there's some possible. I'm uh, oh, sorry. I'm glad that there's some positive results from COVID. Yeah, well, let's talk about that because uh, obviously it disrupted lives, uh, changed the way we do business. But I know for some people that was very advantageous. That they felt very few negative implications from it. How did it affect you personally, and how did it affect you professionally? Well, personally, um, two years of COVID brought me a lot of things. I actually moved my apartment from, a, uh, it's like a, a, a Western lifestyle area of Saigon, Tao Dien, small district far away where my friends live. So during two years of COVID, our families connected better. I spent more time with the kids, with my wife. Um, I understand more on the importance of health. Um, so a lot of good things happen. We was lucky in terms of business because in 2019, we started to transform ourselves already. We started to question the services that we deliver, even question how we build our culture, how we call ourselves 
how we name ourselves the market. So in 2019, we uh, transformed the companies. We connect the companies together in to become a group that could help each other, that could leverage the strength of each other, that could compete in the market together in the right categories that are growing in this market. We review our business strategy. So we were lucky when COVID happened early 2020 that we already be prepared. We have that foundation. So we moved the car uh, plant portfolio into a different industry. We build more creative services that, that, uh, that are more valuable to our uh, clients. So I have to say that, that uh, the two years, 2020 and 2021, so two pretty good years. It was challenging, but um, I always say to uh, our teams that uh, only great companies can flourish during the crisis. And we prove, we have proven to ourselves and some clients that, that we have a strong foundation to grow and to deliver values to them. I was, I feel lucky. We have a good team. Um, I truly feel like they was very connected when we we were separate during the pandemic when we cannot meet each other. But using the online environment, we can still work with each other. Um, we still deliver work. Um, but I'm still happy. Um, there's some challenge in terms of execution because we cannot do some shootings and we cannot deliver some some offline activities like we planned. But um, client can see how we adapt to situation and bring in new ideas, and they always see that we are like one team and always be positive despite the the, the crisis. Well, they say crisis is the great revealer, and obviously people became a bit vulnerable during this time, maybe became even a little more human because of the separation and the the need to adapt, which is part of what humans can do other than any other animal for the most part. And uh, I find it pretty fascinating that you, not only did you hold it together, but I would imagine that some of the processes that you had to put in place to accommodate this situation, you have still in place and and have enabled you to work with clients a little differently and maybe work with some of them even easier than before? Yes, so I actually find that uh, online meetings are somehow very productive. So we can, we can meet more people and we can talk with them more because we can save time on traveling around. Uh, we can always pick up the phone and call people into a meeting, even for our clients. Somehow this, this means that they, they can open for work at any time. So during the uh, pandemic, online meetings actually works. Obviously, it's like other uh, companies I talked to, we, are, we had some challenges in terms of communication, like internal communication, but then we can work that out. We see that this is a potential to to actually um, change the way we, we structure um, the teams and how we communicate to deliver work. And although you were disconnected in that way from your team, did you notice anything significant about not being in the same space together? Because, you know, typically creative people, they're brainstorming, they do spend a lot of time chatting and drinking coffee and fooling around because that's just part of the creative life. But did you notice any drop in quality or enthusiasm or, you know, just good feelings around work? Or did things just keep going on and just change as they needed to? So online work, online work um, with clients was easier, but online work with internal team was very hard. We have to, to, to find many different ways. 
Um, so, you know, creative people always need to, to have some time they can relax and talk to each other over coffee, even some alcohol, so they can get to understand each other or let the ideas come true. For COVID, you cannot do that. So we had some challenges. We had some challenges in terms of how people communicate because when you chat a lot, you don't talk much. Then what you express, the feelings you express over a line of chat, is very different when you talk with your emotion. When you when you can say in your in, in the face. So we have to work around that with some, with some cases. Uh, we can see that uh, sometimes they don't understand each other. But the good thing is that I can always be in each of the groups. Me and, and the, um, the BOD, um, the directors, the head of the department can always be in different groups. We can pick up the signal of um, conflict. So we can, we can work out some, some way. Um, it is a big challenge, a principal challenge, in terms of uh, virtual workspace. Uh, and we, we, we had some solution for that. We already applied it in the office, and we think that we still have to improve it more. And uh, the, I think the, the, the physical workspace, the office, is still important. So that's why we opened a new office in Dalat, where people can enjoy there. So we, we can take some time, go there, still working, and enjoy the project. But at the same time, we open for people who can, you know, can work at home, and you know, online, even be like a part-time uh, part employee of the company. So it's created a lot of flexibility for people to make different kinds of choices about their day-to-day, -day, uh, depending on what their obligations are, what their preferences are, which is something new. I mean, you know, before you went to work and then you went home, you didn't have an option. There was no option. Now there seems to be options and how you can manifest your day, how you can set up your time for yourself and uh, personal time and professional time, which I, I would imagine is like this is the future of human beings working is it's not the basic nine to five stuck in a room. Uh, we've seen that. I mean, there's been scientific studies that say that working from home, that people's productivity went up like 30 percent, even though they were surrounded by their kids and things, potential distractions. But people actually were not chatting a lot in the office. They were at home working and they could focus more. Um, but I guess that depends on the industry too. When, you know, a creative shop is about collaboration. So um, it, it's a little more challenging when you need to bounce ideas off of each other and kind of take a look at what somebody else is doing and, you know, make notes and that kind of stuff. But uh, clearly there needs to be a balance where you can have the best of both worlds, which it sounds like what you're creating as a culture for uh, your company, we hope we can can keep that growing. Um, but yeah, we do combine both of the culture of a creative company and the culture uh, of um, a company where we do have some certain processes that people have to follow. So by doing that, then we we can pull people into collaboration better. Um, so, for example, we set a very clear uh, process of what kind of meetings do we have, who need to join those meetings, um, and who can make decisions at the end of the meeting. By doing that, then uh, the collaboration, brainstorming section, um, it still works. So that's why I'm very positive the new um, working culture. You're listening to The Pure Now Show, a creative podcast for creatives presented by Balance. Let's talk about some challenges uh, in your career. You know, as you started developing, you still had to deal with clients. And maybe that's the most challenging part of the creative business is besides your own internal strategy and how you go about your process, it's maintaining relationships with clients making sure projects are moving smoothly, 
uh, that expectations are being met. Give me or give us the audience, give me an example of maybe a project that didn't go well, but in the end, you learned a lot more about what you needed to know so you can have better experiences going forward. Well, we have many projects like that <laughs> in, um, in um, our, uh, our induction uh, document that we send to newcomers. We always put there a slide where we say, fail better. So, always willing to fail. But fail better, keep failing better. Talk about um, that. Tell me what that means. Tell me what fe fail well, better. I mean, I get it, but I want you to explain what you what you feel is fail better, because I think that's a really good use of words. I started as a whole career in this thing because I I was curious. I wanted to experiment, and I was lucky because all of the people I work with, the bosses that I served before. They always open for me to fail, to try new things. So since I started this company, I always want to put that into our culture. So that's why one of the reasons why we call ourselves pencil. Pencil is 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 what we use to sketch any initial ideas. We have no fear for being for being wrong. So by naming our company pencil, we already. Uh, have that culture behind. Uh, we have our slogan is never run out of ink. So pencil, we don't have the ink, we'll never run out of ink. We always have that energy of ideas, of, 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 of uh, the courage to do things. Um, so feel better is part of our culture because of that. Um, I always uh, want the, the pencil. We call our member, team members are pencil. And we call our office is a pencil box. So each of the pencil have their own colors, but together we become like a creative space. To be able to be, to, uh, to be creative, we, have, we need to have the courage to fail, right? But, but we don't want people to fail a lot. You have to learn from failing. So we are open for failing, but we also require people to learn from failing. So that's why fail better, meaning like fail, but you, if you can learn, keep learning from failing, then you get better and better and better. And actually fail, become better. Because people always think fail is really bad. It affects everybody. It affects the, the, the culture, affects the business, everything. But for us, if you if everyone can learn from failing, it's actually that means fail better. Yeah. So yeah, this was in our um, it's continuously becomes one of our key core values. Well, if you don't fail, you're not doing anything. I mean, you can't do something and not fail, and that's how you. I mean, it does have a negative connotation, but it is the most motivating learning tool that we have is to learn from our experience. Failure just happens to be this word that we created that sounds terrible. But even KFC, Colonel Sanders, he went bankrupt 13 times before he finally came up with Kentucky Fried Chicken that became a, what it is, KFC now worldwide. Um, failure is built in. It's the question of what do you do with that failure? Do you give up? or do you learn from it? Do you try something different? Um, failure is pure opportunity. Uh, and, and a lot of people are afraid of that, but it is, it is something that needs to motivate us to either try something different, go about it a different way, or, or, or give up. Sometimes you have to give up. Sometimes you say, you know what? This is not for me. I'm failing over and over again. I'm not getting something, whatever it is. You know, the, the knocking is at the door. So, but I, I, I think the fail, you fail better is uh, a good motto. And it still encourages people when they do fail that they can redeem themselves 
and and get value out of the failure because uh, people are just too afraid of it. And and again, it's a it's a growth mechanism. It's it's what makes you better, uh, and, and it shows that you've actually attempted something if you actually do fail. Uh, yes, if you do nothing, you cannot fail. That's 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 pretty much. Although you failed yourself by doing nothing, I mean that's failure in itself is by doing nothing. All right, let's talk about a project that you may have had that was over the top successful, even surprised you, and uh, also you learned a lot from that, but just uh, maybe just a model project that uh, pretty much sums up a lot of your creative success. Um, there was a project that, that uh, we're very proud of. We executed last year. Um, so we was approached by one of the biggest banks in Vietnam for their one of the biggest projects they ever done in communication, uh, which is a re repositioning a brand repositioning project for really big bank. Back to that time, we was quite uh, small, you know, compared to other global agency which already in this market for decades and they already have a reputation and so a global network resource to support then we are quite small comparing to them we joined into this um, pitch we was the only local player we uh, we went there with a lot of the uncertain things that we not sure if we can win or not but the good things we did our board directors did was to inspire feel better we talked to our teams and we share the vision of the companies and we share why this pitch is actually really much into the vision of the the group and if we win then our work will be there for 20 years. It's, it's meaning we will change the whole visual, um, the whole custom experience for a, a big bank. Every street out in city here and out in the provinces could see uh, the work we have done. So, and also we can we can bring in like much more ideas. Um, more than all of the traditional work that we have done. So, I still remember the day when we went on the final presentation. The team was awake until 5 a.m. to finalize some visual, some work. We, we brought uh, some uh, uh, print out um, work and set up the whole presentation like a gallery, like a painting gallery. Uh, the board was big. They have representative from all of the departments and they have uh, all the big shareholders of the bank. People who are like billionaires um, that we haven't met before. There, are, there was pressure for young people who descend on that uh, presentation. Um, there was pressure for me as well, because even myself, uh, is, I, I also have pressure on deliver the, the presentation. The whole board directors were there. We, when we talked to ourselves that this is, this is something that we, that we really love to present, whether or not we were chosen, we have been a very good journey on connecting all of the people of the company during COVID time to deliver this kind of work. It's so good that we can be proud of, even if clients choose us or not. And it was so good on feelings you know, that we can develop all of these work in that sort of time. So we push our boundary already. We know that whether or not we win this pitch, we still, we already won our, uh, our capabilities. So we, we, can, we, can, we can win other pitches. And the good thing is that we won. 
we won. So we, we was uh, chosen to uh, to uh, work alongside with that big banks on reposition, designs everything for those from um, key visual communication, uh, branding, uh, new brand drivers, even into um, exterior and interior for the bank. So a lot of the things we can do, um, apps, webs, etc. And that was a, a, a project that, that uh, it was successful out of my expectation. Because even I'll be, I have to be honest because all of our competitors are the biggest company, yeah, of the biggest agency of the world. Right? Now, and they invest the best people they have because this client is big. So even though I am proud of my team, but I have to say that uh, even in the last presentation, after the third round, then I'm still feeling like, hmm, I'm not sure if we can win. Yeah, we just, we just go there, perform very well. But I think it's our chance. So out of the expectation when we, when we receive the results, it was very happy. And we also learn from some things uh, in terms of the way we work with, with clients as well. Now we really believe on how we put a local insights into these uh, things and how we dream big about the brand, a brand role with the Vietnam society. Because one of the things that helped us to be successful on that page was because we inspired that that bank can, be, can, can do more for the country than just be, be a bank. Yeah, it was a good story. Well, you've said many times now about having luck, about being lucky. And uh, there's something to that. I mean, you make your own luck. You have to put yourself in a position to be lucky. You can't be lucky by doing nothing. Uh, and so I think that's an interesting component to your success is aside from putting yourselves uh, out of your comfort zone, uh, pushing on yourselves, there is that element of luck of just things lining up the way you hope. I mean, that's what hope is about, right? You hope you do enough work. You hope you do the right work. So you get the results you want. You get the relationships you want. I mean, we all want to be lucky, of course, but you have to put effort in for that luck to materialize. People don't just get lucky for nothing. Uh, there has to be some kind of, it's like a, an invisible agreement. If you do something, we'll give you a little more chance uh, will give you that luck, that extra little thing uh, to hopefully put you over the top. Uh, but that doesn't come from doing nothing. Um, another component of your life that I find fascinating is that you're a lecturer. And I actually showed up at one of your lectures not knowing it was going to all be in Vietnamese. But I stayed for a little bit because you were on stage and you have very good charisma and you have good stage presence and you were interesting to watch, and then I left because I don't know what's going on. So, uh, but you you had captured the the attention of the audience, and they were very into what you were saying. And uh, uh, tell me about the lecture thing. How did that start, and uh, uh, what has that done for you personally, as far as uh, your self confidence, your self esteem, uh, as well as maybe helping service uh, your company with the exposure that you've gotten. Well, I really want to know more about that uh, that time when you <laughs> arrived in the room. Uh, but, um, uh, well, I, I was, um, to answer your question, I was not very confident on big meetings before. And uh, back when, uh, when the time I worked at Ogilvy, there were some big meetings with big clients that I feel, you know, I'm not, not, not so confident for that. And um, I realized I need to practice that. So that was the reason why I had to um, to, to to approach some of the uh, schools, so I can design um, uh, some uh, programs based on my own experience. When well, back when uh, I started those lecture, um, because one of the reason why is because digital marketing was very new in Vietnam and there was no, um, no um, 
no comprehensive programs to teach people the strategy behind everything you do. So people always talk about Facebook, Google, uh, a landing page, a mobile app, rather than talking about the inside behind, uh, how we connect all of those channels together. So I, I realized there's a gap there. And I also realized that I need to step out and meet more people so that I can grow. So I decided to t take some of my experience, go to some school, telling them that I can do this. So I designed the programs and started to do lecturing from it's since uh, 2013. Um, I'm not doing much right now anymore, um, only some uh, conference. Uh, then I can uh, share some experience. Uh, but uh, I really do appreciate the time when I can come on to the classes and uh, tell people about my experience. Um, more and more, I feel more confident in presenting my ideas, I feel more confident on connecting other people's ideas. And I also learn a lot from the people who listen to me because when they ask us their question, then I realize that what I have done with the big companies are not applied into the medium companies or the small companies. So I have to think deeper into the principles. I have to think deeper into what I have done and how I measure the results of what I have done. And I can share more to my teams and I can, I can even change my mindset, change the strategic thinking framework that I used to have. You're listening to The Pure Now Show, a creative podcast for creatives presented by Balance. Well, you know, People are only afraid of death second to public speaking. And based on the results that you've received, and I think more often than not, most people would receive uh, an interesting result if it was a fundamental part of our education. I think we need to know how to stand up for ourselves, how to have that self-building of confidence and self-esteem that would allow us to communicate better, to connect better, to be available for more opportunities. And I think you are uh, representative of a direct result of needing to do that in order to do your job better and how much that helps so many other people aside from yourself, which is even more important that you did do it for yourself, but you ended up helping a lot of other people through your willingness to fail, through your experimentation, and through your effort uh, and whatever luck that came along with that uh, is all just due to your willingness to put yourself out there at risk and be vulnerable in front of people. I'm, I'm very glad that I have done that. It changed myself, it also changed how I, uh, you know, and it's also helped a lot when I started my own business because back to that time then oh, some people already know me. Before, when I work, I was really focused into believing, delivering the work, not to, to, to stand up and uh, take ownership of the ideas or take uh, ownership of uh, the, the, the thoughts. After a few years of doing uh, the lecturing thing, I feel much better in terms of uh, how I can connect with people, especially how, can I, how I, I can discuss with the ideas. Let's talk about, now did the, the, the becoming an author come before or after the lecturing? After, much um, long after that, long after that, because uh, I, I always think that I could, couldn't have the, the enough patience to write books. And I think there's no way I can do that. But then I realized that you don't have to write everything to write a book. Um, you can share your experience, you can work with other people, um, and you can always be, be a book author by sharing your thinking. It's, publishing a book is not technically typing what you think. It is about gathering all of the thoughts, organize all of your thoughts, getting feedback from people, getting support from other people, building up the thinking, building up the case study, building up what you have done, and then 
at the end, at the end of the journey, you have something that was written and it become something valuable to be published as a book. So, for example, my latest book, um, the uh, the digital social marketing strategy book, it was the content the content of my lecture. So I, I do a lot of lecture in different um, in different topics. So those was recorded, and then a, and then a teams uh, in the, uh, the the book the publishing companies that we invested in. They helped me to bring it into a format of a book. Well, I mean, you, you you've taken on all these challenges and you've executed and 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 been successful. Which leads me to my next question: Is how do you balance your? I'm not going to say professional and personal life because it's it's two sides of the same coin. But how do you create balance in your life so you have enough time for your family, you have enough time to work, and you have enough time for yourself? And what do you do with your free time? I I have a lot of interest. Uh, I curious. I'm curious with many things. I join a lot of uh, marathon uh, uh, events. I uh, I join uh, some speaking opportunities where I can meet other people and talk with them about the business that they're doing, the ideas that they have. I love to meet young people uh, to learn about how they experience the internet. So, so there's a lot of things that I do, which which are the which are part of the business that we do. I chose this business because it has a lot of room to learn from about people, and I find learning from people is a way we do better work. And learning from people is a hobby as well. So I love to watch um, podcasts or listen to podcasts with books that always, always those knowledge come into our work. So I used to be uh, exalted when I worked in the corporate world when I was younger. But when I started the company, the first few years were quite busy. But then later, I find the the combination of the time I spend for learning and the time I spend for working. For the time learning, then I always combine with family activities. So I take my family together with me on a lot of the things, like uh, you know, watching films together, sometimes watching comics together. Yes, yeah, those things like that. I don't think much about the balance between work and life. I just feel that it is just a way on finding new things. Learning about a brief from clients is a good thing when I can read something about that, that category, that market. Just read more about people who are like young women or high school, high schooler. There's always a curiosity in, in this business, and curiosity is a, probably the thing that connects life and work in this industry. And it's in, uh, an opportunity it's for us to combine all of these things together. I hope that I can help other young people at the companies feel in that way, the same way, because like other companies, sometimes they also feel like Exalted. I'm working on uh, some ways to share more to people on how they can do that. So having a, a, an office in Dalat is part of one of the way we can do that. So we can feel like we work in a, in a very good environment, and we can always take some time off between the job, the task, to read something, listen to to good songs. Cyclone. There's always a room to to be uh, to be fun in the work, so I don't see that there's uh, 
it to be a balance. Let's talk about advice. Well, again, you're lucky, but you're creating your own luck. And let's see how you would help create luck for others. What advice would you have for young people coming up in the industry? It's changed a lot. Um, I mean, it's a lot of it's remote. There's a lot more technology involved with it. For young people who are interested in a creative career of sorts, what kind of a trajectory would you recommend? What kind of a strategy for going about becoming a creative professional in these times? Young people now is quite different with myself back when I was young. I think back when I was young, there's not a lot of option to choose from. So when you already can make money on something, then that seems like a good choice. To... Nowadays, I'm not sure if I'm, I'm right, but uh, a lot of the young people um, tend to move with what they like. So they want to go with the flow moving with um, any ideas that come up and be very um, uh, be very flexible on choosing a career path so they can jump from here and there. We see turnover rate in advertising companies really high. Uh, it's really hard to keep people. My advice to young people, I think experiments and think things are very good. Being curious or not, things are very good. But always they have to find a good team to be to grow together. Find an environment to work that where you can grow how you think. And at the same time, in your free time, experiment with your other interests. So don't get pulled off from the main job just to do things that you like. There's always a two part where you can where you can experiment and also you can develop your long term career. Maybe at the, some at some point you may find a different career, but you know. It's always better to stick into a road and at the same time you can watch the sky. Right? But if you always look up to the sky, you don't have any road. Probably one day you will be lost and it's not fun. That's, uh, I like that, always looking up. You actually you can't possibly know where you're going if you're always looking up. Unless you can read the stars, of course. But not everybody's Galileo and can actually navigate. And during the day, you can't see the stars. So you can't really navigate in the daytime by looking up. The other question I have is, if you could not do what you're doing, none of what you're doing, no creative work at all, no strategy, you had to do something completely different, whether it was paid or unpaid, but you had to find something else to do. What would you be interested in doing? Your question is, uh, if I have a second career, what would I choose? Would yeah, it's not even a second career. If whatever, you've been wiped. You cannot do what you're doing anymore. You have to find something else to do. You're not able to do that. What else would you want to do? What else do I want to do? The good things of being an entrepreneur is that I can actually do anything I want. Uh, if I want to, I want to do movies and I can invest it into film companies and I did that. If I want to learn how to make music, I invested into a music company and we did do that. And they all work with our companies here, with our core business here to deliver things and at the same time I can learn um, about the industry. So um, um, I I don't know if there's uh, if I have that um, the answer to that question. Well let me rephrase the question then. What aren't you doing in your life that you would like to be doing? Or are you doing everything exactly the way you want it? I have to say that I'm doing everything exactly the way I want it. Okay. And yeah, the companies, even in the companies, we have, we are an independent, freedoms and happy companies. You know, the, 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 uh, 
what do they call that? The uh, slogan for the country, for this country, is independent freedom and happiness. In Pencil Group, we believe in that as well. So, just a bit about the business. We have a rule where none of our clients can exceed 20% of the revenue of the company. So, we keep that rule to be independent from any major clients. So, even if something happens to a, a, a revenue stream, we can always find a way to adapt. By doing those, by, by, by having those principles, the, the good thing is that we, we can keep ourselves independent, freedom, and because of that, we're happy. Right now, so I'm, I'm pretty happy that I can do things the way I want. Um, there's some things more that I want to do that I don't have enough money yet to do, but I'm finding a way to do that. So um, if I can do more, then um, I wish I could develop these companies into like a creative network where we can gather creative people from different skill set into a community where we can do cool things for brands, but also do cool things for the communities. We are doing that. We are trying to build um, from process to culture to even location um, for people to do that. Um, we're pretty slow on that because of the financial um, resources. But you know, we, we make progress, so I'm, I'm feeling good about that. Well, you'll probably get some luck because of what you're doing and you'll, you'll fulfill that, that dream. I want to thank you very much, We for coming on the Pure Now Show. It was really great to talk to you. Appreciate your candidness about your stories and your life and uh, wish you all the best. Thank you. It's my pleasure to be with you. Um, I think I was inspired by other creative leaders that you talk to. I hope my, my story somehow can, can, can inspire young creatives. And uh, I really hope you can keep uh, on doing this great work. Cheers, man. If you enjoyed the Pure Now show, you can check out more episodes at balancestudio.tv or anywhere fine podcasts are broadcast. Pure Now is produced and engineered by Hai Ha Dang and directed by Dong Wun Guan. Thanks so much for watching.